So today we're going to be finishing up Romans chapter 1. I don't have a whole lot of slides for this particular lesson, but we're going to spend a lot of time on each one. So there's a lot of information. And I just didn't want to like build a bunch of slides, but most of it I'm hoping is going to be some good discussion. Not just me vomiting the words. So our title today for this one, <clears throat> The Lies and Failure of Religious Actions. Yeah. All right. So, so far, and I apologize, my voice is going to be really coarse. The cold that my kids had last week, I think, is trying to fight through me, and and uh, I've not felt good the last couple of days. Today, I felt the best I ever have this week, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but we have learned so far about sin, judgment, and the shortcomings of just good actions, as well as education, that is the knowledge of God or how much people know. But what is the bridge for these regarding those who go to church and those who don't? So, <clears throat> before we answer that, Paul has said, here's a list of the evil that you're doing. Here's the list of things that you're, I mean, you're not only just doing them, but you're condoning. Mm -hmm. And then here's the people you're, you're judging for doing the same things that you're already doing. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and then he says that there's, everybody has this knowledge of God and everybody's going to be judged by God based on this knowledge. Um, whatever you have. So for the unsaved, <clears throat> that's kind of the list of things that's going on. But then there's the people that go to church. And there's a common denominator that makes the people that go to church under these categories the same as the people who are just evil and unrighteous and everything else like that. And the, the bridge is that we're going to talk about here first. But let's, before we answer again, let's read the text. So, <clears throat> Romans chapter 2, 17 through 29. Let me get there. All right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I think it's I'll be one of those 30 in the library. Through, okay. Yeah, page 36 through 41 in the exposition will we'll be touching on a couple things in there. <clears throat> but yeah, so verse 17, we'll start there in chapter 2 of Romans. <clears throat> but if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law and boast in God, and know his will and approve what is excellent because you instructed you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, are you stealing? Mm -hmm. You say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you who abhor idols, and ro do you rob temples? You who boast and dishonor God by breaking the law, for it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written the code and circumcision but break the law. <clears throat> For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit and not by the letter. He praise is, His praise is not from man, but from God. <clears throat> There's a lot to unpack there. Mm -hmm. And again, I apologize. Not well. Okay, so back to the question. What's the bridge between what we've talked about so far regarding just people in our sinful state and then the people who are in church? We're the Jews all, in this context. We're all sinful. But we're, all, whoop, we're all sinful. All under judgment. <clears throat> Religious rituals, religion itself, dogmatic ideas, and legalistic rules. Because the people 
who are trusting in that are just as wrong as the people who are actually committing the acts against the law, being evil in the sight of God. You're trusting in something that is not real for your own salvation. Um, but what are, let's talk about some of these. What are some of them? Just any traditions and following. <clears throat> Right. Like um, even, and I don't want. I'm not saying this in a slanderous heart, but doing the Lord's prayer, mm -hmm. um, and thinking that that you're really even praying when you're just saying words. It's just yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's not even in your heart. <laughs> so some obvious ones like infant baptism. Mm -hmm. Thinking that that's what saves you. I was just gonna say the whole Catholic religion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the first one, for sure. Quite a bit. Um. Because they'll hold to that uh, first two quite a bit. Yeah. They they hold to that identity and the true church, like it's the only church. But then they have a lot of rel religious rituals that they claim are either to get you saved or right. would keep you saved. And all those, of course, are false. So the confirmation. <clears throat> um, but we have some of our own in, in some of the evangelical and Baptist realms, right? So Many. There's, there's the... Uh, more probably legalistic or dogmatic ideas of how we dress. Yep. <clears throat> Women have to wear dresses and have long hair. Men have to wear pants and have short hair. Well, we want, we want people to wear yeah. clothes. Well, it's clothes, right? <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> well, even even, um, <clears throat> even uh, the self-righteous attitude mm -hmm. is dogmatic mm -hmm. foolishness. Yep. Like, you, it, it tells you right here. That yeah. you who, who are accusing other people do the same things. Right. And they, they're doing it in their life, mm -hmm. but they're just doing it in different ways. So if you're doing that, you're, you're just being dogmatic and legalistic. Right. You and you, you set this this tone, I mean, and it gets it gets harsh. Yeah. And we're going to see more of this throughout Romans, because Paul's, this is just like, he's just like starting to scrape the top of the iceberg of this particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think about education, I do Homeschool, public school, private school, your kids. That can get to be a very dogmatic thing yeah. for some Christian families. Um, well, even, even the act of going to church. That, I was, was going to say, that's coming up, up the act of actually being in church itself. I have to be here. Why are you yeah, here? You don't right? be, you know, you're not going to worship or fellowship or learn. You're just going because it looks good. It right. makes me feel good. And that dog mm -hmm. here is, thinks it's dogmatic. <laughs> is that why you come, Tom? Just kidding. <laughs> Just to start off. Listen. <laughs> so, Paul is, the, the Jews in this time were no different in the context of what they had for this stuff. The Pharisees, so I heard it said this way a long time ago, and I've loved this analogy. You, each of us are a house, let's say, on a, on a property, we're, we're the house. Yeah. And God sets up the fence line and says, your yard is to here. What the Pharisees do, and what people in religious um, sects or, or get overly dogmatic, legalistic, what they will do is say, well, God's fence is too far. And so they put another rule that pushes you closer and closer to your own house. Because they're like, we don't want to break God's law. So we got to put other laws to keep you from even getting close. If you break these laws, it's bad, but it's okay because you're not breaking God's law. We're not getting that far. We're going to keep you close. But then the closer and closer you let those rules put you in your yard, you end up with no yard, and you're just in a prison. God's law is the boundary. That's the only boundary. And the problem is, is that <clears throat> the Pharisees did this. And the Jews, when the Gentiles started getting saved, they did the same thing. And we're going to see a little bit more of this today and then going further. They're like, we have all of this. This is the rules. And Paul's like, no, that the rules mean nothing without Christ. Romans 7. <clears throat> That's right. That's it. That's the... So I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, to be saved, to stay saved. But the change from my actions, I want to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to be baptized to go to heaven after I'm saved. But if I live after I get saved, the, the will of the Father is that I want to, to show that outward, that I give the outward example of my inward change. And so that's the difference between, and so we're going to talk a lot about the people who fit these rules here today. <clears throat> 
going forward in my oh my animation stuff. All right, well we get all the answers first. That's cool. Um, <laughs> so so in regards to verses seventeen to twenty three, what is the law? Because here he always says, "You saw yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God." So what law is he talking about? It's up there. Yeah. It's, it's fine. <laughs> it's God's moral standard. Right. <laughs> Um, that was given to the Jews to use as an example for the rest of the world. The Jews were chosen, they were a chosen people, but they were not chosen as the only people. They were chosen to, to have the knowledge to then show the Gentile nations what was, you know, what was right and wrong and, and where it is. So, however, having the law in their face to see the entirety of what God found evil and just, instead puffed up the Jews' pride, believing that by default, since they had the law, they were all chosen to be saved. Mm -hmm. And this attitude stretched into the, the church afterwards, especially as Gentiles were getting saved. In a few of Paul's letters, he addresses the issue of circumcision um, and a few other Jewish traditional things as opposed to the, salvation, the, the saving power of Jesus. Um, <clears throat> but why does then Paul focus on the blind says, if you are so sure you're going to call yourself a guide to the blind, a light to the darkness, but then you're doing everything that you're teaching against. And it's a blind leading the blind. So here, let's go to Matthew chapter 15. Mm -hmm. And just read the passage where Jesus talks about that. Because that's where this is coming from. <clears throat> Verses 10 through 20. <clears throat> yep. So in chapter 15, Jesus talks about a lot of the different traditions and commandments of man versus God and what is truly um, in the first half. He, he talks about this. So in verse 10, he talks about what really defiles a person. Mm hmm. And he says, he called the people to him and he said, Jesus says here, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. And then the disciples came to him. Do you know what the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? <laughs> and so Jesus, he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let him alone. They are blind guides. Mm -hmm. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is, and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart comes the evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. <clears throat> but to eat and wash hands is not does not defile anyone. So if you're going to preach law, <laughs> yeah, you're going to die by it. You're gonna, yeah. You know, you, Paul is saying, if you're going to preach the law, but you're, you're all guilty of the law, how are you, because it's what you're doing out there, you can say, yeah, do this, don't do this. But then you're the ones that's still going to turn around and do it. I don't understand. Where, Paul's like, where, where are you talking about? Because now you're just, you're saying do this, but you're also doing it. So you're just, like Jesus said, you're the blind, leading the blind, confusing and contorting the gospel here. Um, and he's go he's got the perfect examples there. He's got all of them in there. The Pharisees are offended. Mm -hmm. So the disciples, and then he said, you still are without understanding? Yeah. yeah. What a rebuke. Yeah. So the first thing is the, the religious leaders, right? Mm -hmm. These are, you know. These are the people that get overly legalistic, a little dogmatic, you know, will be the ones that will metaphorically slap the Bible over your head, even as another Christian, because you're not doing yep. it right, according to them. Uh, Sounds <laughs> like your metaphor that people who are saved that actually have an inner offense. It's invisible. It's like, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. They don't, they don't need an outer offense. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're just trying to live their life according yep. to God and according to the Word. Yeah, if, I, if, God, if God has the boundary set based on what His Word is and what the Holy Spirit is, you know, working in conjunction with this. Yeah, you, you, don't, know, you don't need a fence. Then I don't need, right, because it'll, it'll stay right where I'm supposed to. Anyway. 
But so Paul here is beginning to show that true perfection is impossible by anyone, and this will come up again later as well. <clears throat> because he's he lists us here, he's like, you're preaching against this thing, and then you're doing it. You yeah. preach against this thing, and you're guilty of this. Mm -hmm. So before it was, now you're, you're judging people for doing it, condoning people for doing it, and now he's addressing the people, more specifically the Jews here, he's like, look, you're preaching against it, but you're also doing it. It's like, you're just as wrong. <laughs> so verse Jesus, Jesus said don't don't do as the Pharisees do but do as what they say what they do. right yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <clears throat> so verse 24 for it is written the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you that's a harsh statement mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> for Jews yeah for, yeah, yeah. But let's put that in our perspective. The name of God is blaspheming among your neighbors because of you. The name of God is blaspheming among the people around your church because of you. Yep, the name of God is blaspheming among your coworkers because of you. Mm -hmm. Me. So don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> that's, that's right. Don't be the hypocrite. <laughs> So, Paul is actually quoting this because he says, as it's written. Um, do you guys know where this comes from? Yeah. Um, the Bible. <laughs> You're right. Same, Absolutely same right. Answer. Answer. <laughs> well, yeah, it's used all throughout the Bible. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy, though, and mm -hmm. like it's, as it's written um, mm -hmm. all the way back into um, <clears throat> Matthew 4. Boy, yeah. Jesus. Yep. The answer, uh, I know. So yeah. specifically, uh, what I found was Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. 5. Yeah. Um, and this one is where God's talking about uh, Babylon. And Jesus says here, he's talking to Isaiah. Now, therefore, what I have, what have I here? Declares the Lord. Seeing that my people are taken away for nothing, the rulers wear wail, declares the Lord. And continually all the day, my name is despised. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... It is one thing to have people hate God, and God understands those people will hate Him. It is quite another to have God's people, through their hypocrisy and prideful attitude, cause others to hate God. Mm -hmm. And that wow. Paul is addressing this right here. And uh, I kind of wish I touched—I touched on that a little bit in my exposition. I wish I had maybe expanded a little more. When you, look at the, when you look at the Ten Commandments, that that one that says that not to, you know, take the Lord's name in vain. That's taking the Lord's name <clears> in vain because you're making other people. Right. Him vainly. Yes. Like he's vain. Like he's vain. Like he's nothing. So it's not just like going G D this or that. Or mm -hmm. Right. No. It's, it's like yeah. Anything like that is blasphemy. That and if you take all the Ten Commandments, you can expand them. Right. Because it's too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Because and we learned before, like God judges the intentions as well as the actions. So even if I don't Thank do you. an action, but I have an intention. A judgment is just as equal. And when we're out doing whatever, saying, don't do this, do mm -hmm. this, or I'm a Christian, so I fit this. You can live like the devil. Yeah. And then turn around and have people hate God because of you. Because of some, you know. Yeah. Now, we know, uh, I'll, I'll put this, this, you know, this clarity here, of course, because we know people will hate God and hate us because we're Christians. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. If they hate you because you're doing something right, mm -hmm. that's very different from you playing the two-faced game mm -hmm. and them hating God because you give this this one example of being a Christian. You know, and you might not experience like this hate. And this blaspheme is is more just their internal attitude. If they're if you act a certain way or say a certain thing, and they know you're a Christian, and then they in their private life they're like, I can't believe this, or I don't want to because I've seen this. God knows that. Mm -hmm. You might not ever see the blaspheme of, of God towards that for your for what they see in you, but God certainly does. I was reading the larger uh, Westminster Catechism last night, and it's like they expanded all the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> and I have to I have to admit that I was kind of sweating at the end of reading it because I, it's like I wasn't even close to hurting any of them. Break, I'm breaking all of them. Oh. And then, and then, well, you know what I get. <clears throat> yeah. In, in some degree that you never think of those gray areas. Yeah. 
what we just talked about. And then, and then I thought to myself, I'm so glad that Christ died for my sins. He was perfect. He kept them all and died for me. Because there's no way on earth, even as a Christian, knowing that I, I, I couldn't do it. Yeah. I can't do it. No. Well, and that was the whole point of the law to begin with, was to have this knowledge to understand that you can't be good enough. Mm -hmm. And what they did instead is they put the, the sacrifices themselves thinking that was still the only way. Not understanding the sacrifice of Jesus replaced their sacrifices. You know, they didn't see that they were sinful people and needed these sacrifices to atone. And that was the, the line of their imperfection. Right. <laughs> they seemed to think that even if they followed, they, had the, they did these sacrifices, then they were still good enough. To get into heaven, and God was the whole time. It's like no. Just, just a, an observation. <clears throat> I think that's what makes when you want to preach the gospel to someone, mm -hmm. you need to need to show this is why, because we're all guilty. Yeah. Before God, no. Okay, so you didn't do the big crimes, but we're all guilty uh, yes. in God's eyes of something mm -hmm. where. Then the, that's why the the gospel is such good news, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because we, yeah, it's, yeah, there's an utter failure that we have, yeah, in in any regards to trying to be good enough in God's eyes. Doesn't work. And I think a lot of times we always put that humanistic twist on every action. It's like, well, it's not that bad. Yeah, I mean, I'm bad, but not that bad. Right. All right. So we kind of talked about this. So how is our example then? Um, the quote from my book, page 37. <clears throat> the Jews and the law were supposed to be the spiritual guides to the nations, but instead they were blind, thinking that they themselves were the only ones to be saved. And with this attitude, Jesus said they were blind. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, like I said, the premise here that Paul's, mm -hmm. Paul's building on is like, you're no better, you're no different, and you've totally corrupted the idea of, of what it was that you had this knowledge in the first place. Like the Gentiles didn't have this knowledge, and they, they didn't have the full scope of the law, but they were kind of doing what was right or, and knew kind of what was wrong based on what God's given in our own mm -hmm. conscience. You were supposed to illuminate that for them. <laughs> and they didn't. <clears throat> All right, so the problem with religious people, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 25 through 29 then, he hits hard on the concept of circumcision because that was the big key point of the Jewish nation as a physical action as opposed to, you know, the uh, Gentile nations. All right. So what kind of testimony were the Jews supposed to have building on this? So, Because Paul talks about this, and so he says, look, if a man is uncircumcised but keeps the precepts of the law, doesn't he then, isn't he defaultly regarded as someone who is physically circumcised? And just as someone who is circumcised, they don't keep the law, don't you regard them as uncircumcised? Mm -hmm. So why is the circumcision the key point for your whether you're saved or not, or chosen or not. The idea of the Jews were supposed to be that they had all of God's law, which meant that they knew God's judgment, which meant they also were supposed to have the knowledge of God's salvation from that judgment and share it. This was, this was the whole point, was to, to broad scope this. And how about the church today? We should be... It's the same. Yeah. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> we, we as the church today have the full Bible, all of God's word, so we know what is right and wrong, and so we know God's law, we know where his judgment is coming, and then we know his plan for this. So this, I mean, our plan is the same as the, the church's plan, is the same as the Jew, what the Jews' plan was supposed to be. Galatians 2 um Paul goes right to Peter. Oh yeah, and he says, yeah. "You, you hypocrite." Yeah, that's what he called him. <clears throat> now that, and back in those days, uh, and it's still today. We just don't yeah. put the force behind it. That yeah. that's like saying you you make believer you phony. Right, and you know, and it's really interesting with that one because some people jump on the word hypocrite and they kind of use it a little loosely. Yeah. Hypocrite does not mean that I go to church on Sunday and then I, you know, told a lie during the week. Right. And come back to church on Sunday like it like it never happened. 
a true hypocrite, yeah. like what Peter was doing, yeah. is hanging out with your Jesus friends. Yep. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> Jesus is great. I love Jesus. And then going to hang out with your non-Jesus friends yep. and being like, yeah, I'm not a big Christian person either. I don't like the Bible. Somehow, which one is really real? <laughs> only God knows. Only, only God knows. Yeah. Right. But Peter was doing that because he was hanging out with the Gentiles, right? Saying like, it's okay. Eat. Our law doesn't matter. You can you can do whatever. Like as far as like the Jewish customs, they, they don't apply to you. You're still sitting Christian, whatever. But then he'd go hang out with the Jewish friends and be like, I know they're a problem because they're not abiding by our laws. <laughs> right. And Paul was like, Okay, <laughs> we're done. Oh. Um, and it, that's kind of a wake-up call for even us because it's just our own reminder of mm -hmm. what are we doing with our friends outside of church and in the London church. Yeah, there's a very fine line between between being a hypocrite and a coward. Yes. Because, yes. I mean, I've been cowardly a lot of times and I didn't right. really give, do, say something or do something. I would, it, you know, I suppose you could call me a hypocrite, but maybe not, maybe. But look at Nicodemus, <clears> too, I mean. <throat> You know what I mean? Was he a coward or was he a hypocrite or was he a, was he sarcastic? What was he? Right. Yeah, no, and, and this is where, like, again, we're not to judge the hearts. You know, God knows we can go off the, the outward actions. I think there is an obvious line where we can see, like, like right. I said, with Peter, with, we're an obvious hypocrite. But there's certainly times where I have been quiet when maybe I should have said something. We all have. You know, and, and I, I guess I don't necessarily think of that as being hypocritical because I didn't deny anything outright. I didn't condone what they were doing, but people will use the argument. A neutral answer is a condoning answer. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you don't say... You're condoning it. Yeah, because yeah. if you don't say at least if you don't, yeah, if you don't say anything to one way or another, then you're at least allowing whatever it is right. to be allowed. So, I, <clears throat> I mean, again, that, that goes back to the the hard issue of the individual and that's between between you and God. And you know, I, I keep going back to um, Luke and the Samaritan and the Pharisee mm -hmm. and um, how Jesus said, who really, you know, who really is the one that's going to be justified? Yeah. Because the Pharisee was condemning that man. Thank God I'm not like him. Right. And then the, the, the Samaritan was, went over and, you know, the, and, bound up his wounds and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the, the real pattern of Christianity. It's You're not binding it up to, to look good. You're doing it because it's just empathy for that individual suffering. Yeah. And you feel, because you're Christian, you feel that these people need it, regardless if they deserve it or not. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not your right to judge it. Just you do it because God would do it. Yeah. And that's the change yeah. that we have. Any religious action we do take, it should come from the results of our inward change. Mm -hmm. Out of a desire to want. Not a desire to, I have to. Mm -hmm. Because it helps me maintain anything. <clears throat> so instead of doing what they were supposed to do, and a lot of times doing what we're supposed to do, the Jews, thinking that the circumcision and the law would save them, just, I'm sorry, just like the Jews thinking the circumcision and the law would save them, the church has built several religious actions that mean you're saved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Baptism <laughs> being one. <laughs> um, what translation Bible do you use? <laughs> I never heard that one. Oh, oh yeah. That's, oh. You know, oh, yeah, it's a big There's some King James purists out there. <laughs> whether, you, whether you keep the Sabbath on Sunday. Or I was going to say Sabbath on Sunday yeah, or that, Saturday. That Presbyterians, you swear that they're saying you better keep it just like the Jews mm -hmm. did. Yeah. They, yep. I, maybe I'm wrong, but that's I, what it looks like to me. I know. That's the same. No, I, I've always taken as long as you take one day. But, yeah. they, but, but it looks like the Presbyterian, the, in that Westminster Catechism, it looks like you stay home, you do God's work and do nothing else. Whatever. Or no, that's wrong. Church. Yep. It almost looks like they're saying you've got to obey that commandment. Yep. Colossians mm. 2 throws that right under the bus. Yeah, I, I know. know. But I'm just saying that's what that catechism says. Right? Yeah. And that's the Presbyterian Reformed Catechism. Yeah. No, and I, I guess that there's, you know, um, I mean, I grew up in a, a fairly legalistic church in some sense, and 
So there was a lot, like I said, it was, there was the dress, you know, women should wear dresses, mm -hmm. men should, you know, wear pant, long hair, mm -hmm. short hair. Yeah. There was the Bible translation. There was, you yeah. can't play cards. You can't, you can't drink at all. Cause they yeah. naively would always say it was juice that, and I was like, you can't, or dance. There's no, you can't yeah. dance though. No, you can't dance at all. Yeah. Yeah. No. I can't dance at all. <clears throat> I, mean, I don't, I am much either, but there's. <laughs> David did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where, yeah, but where do they get that from? Because where does it say that you, like, you can't dance in the Bible? They make it up. I know, but I'm just saying, though. Yeah. No, all, at, they, all they do is they take this idea of what dancing has become on the worldly side, and they say you can't be a that part of that moving your body or, or getting close to someone who's not your spouse if you're dancing as a couple with someone that you're not married to, you know, whatever, that kind of thing. But you won't do that anyway. And I was going to say, kind of still like, well... Maybe, but if I'm only with my spouse, I don't understand. Um, mm -hmm. They would say no movie theaters because you don't know what, you can't like censor it like you could in your own house if it's something a movie you don't know. And I said, well, don't go to a movie you don't think you'd know that would have something you think would be in it. I don't know. <laughs> um, the King James, of course, because they'll use some excuse for how things were missing out of other translations, even though that's been proven to be shown very erroneously that that's not the case. Um, the, uh, the no playing cards because it's a form of gambling and we don't we don't believe in gambling or luck so you can't do anything like that. Uh, long hair, they take from Corinthians when Paul said it, men shouldn't have long hair. Um, but I, <coughs> two verses down because he goes like women should have their heads covered when they when they pray, mm -hmm. which is where the Mennonites take that into context. But while they always like almost kind of Amish but not quite, and they yeah. have the, the head coverings, yeah. but. Two verses down in that same passage in Corinthians, Paul says, "We, if any of you seem to be contentious, the church has no such teaching to the, the churches of God. So it, it was more just his personal opinion, as he was stating, and when I looked into this culturally, and this didn't come so many years later after I had that argument with people in my church when I was in high school, <laughs> um, I realized that the reason Paul was doing it there was because contextually, male prostitutes would have long hair and women female prostitutes would have shorter hair mm -hmm. to identify themselves as such and so paul was making it clear for them in corinth they're like hey you should probably not look like them yeah. to at least distinguish yourself more definitively not that it's against god not that god cares how long your hair is <laughs> that's what he said if any of you seem to be contentious the church would have any such teachings but <laughs> well samson right yeah. How long hair do you have? <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I brought that up when I, many, many years ago. And said, well, he took a Nazarite vow. It's not something that, that was, we can... That was before to. the Roman Greco. <laughs> yeah. That was pre-Roman Right. Greco. Yeah, so I, I I don't know. They had all little times of this, you know, and, and I don't know where they got the alcohol thing from because the Bible clearly states that you know, don't get drunk. Right. But they would say that it was juice in the New Testament. I was like, oh, that must be some potent juice. I don't understand how people are getting drunk off of juice. I don't know. <laughs> but, well, Jesus made wine. But that's right, that Jesus. I was going to say, how many times is wine mentioned in the Bible? Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 And it's, it's just naive to think. Now, I will say that from what I have found, and I, I can't really confirm anything one way or another, I'm not a scholar in that, but what I've found most of the wine then was not as high of an alcohol content as we have today. Right. So it, it, most of the wine may have been more like a beer at like the 6%, 4 mm -hmm. to 6% alcohol, whereas our wine today is right around 10% usually, mm -hmm. as far as the alcohol well, they, content. They were fermenting the water basically for, to, to use like what we use for chlorine. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they were just using alcohol yeah. and keeping it, you know, keeping the bacteria levels. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. Actually... So I mean, like I said, there was you know, there's, but those are little nuances. I mean, that I grew up with in a church that was like really adamant that this needed to be you know. listening. Yeah. Um, I had a relative who saw one of my sermons from a while ago, and tell me that uh, they liked it, a lot of good stuff, but they said I should be wearing a tie. Yeah. <laughs> and I said nope. <laughs> I said, I don't get brownie points in heaven for wearing a tie behind the pulpit, nor do I get brownie points for dressing up in church. Not that it's something that maybe we shouldn't consider as far as giving our best to the Lord in that sense, but... Respect. Right. But... 
Yeah, but that's kind yeah, of all you, all comes down to what you feel is how how you want to dress, right? I mean, what yeah. what what is the attire that you want to present yourself as? Yeah, no, exactly. And it's the Bible says you need to wear clothes that are meant for you and be modest. Be modest. And culturally, those styles have changed, you know, yeah. a dozen times over. So we can't sit here and say that one style is yeah. Christian and one style is is not. Oh. Right. Well, and you could even go to the the degree of if you dress up really nice, like you you're kind of taking away from you know what I mean. Like you, everyone's looking at you, right? <laughs> yep. There is a line for sure. Everyone's looking at you because you're well dressed. <laughs> yep. It's like it. So you, it's kind of a matter of the heart, right? Yes. What absolutely. you feel like is acceptable to wear, with yep. but like it can kind of be taken in both, like mm-hmm. underdress or overdress to me. Yeah. No, definitely. I I agree. And in fact, there's some. Some preacher some time ago he mentioned something about um, women who are, who will get dressed up for church in his church in the south, you know. And he's like, "Is this the only time your husband sees you dressed up?" Mm. Good point. He was like, "If you only get dressed up to go out to church like that, which is nice, who are you dressing up for then?" If if your own husband the can't Lord. see you dress up, you know, right? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a, again, it was a kind of a heart issue, like right. making them reflect on, am I going up there to look good for everybody else? So. It, it's kind of a thing, too, though, but like if you're a VP or, you know, vice president or something of a, of a or president of a company, you're not going to come into a board meeting wearing <clears> jeans and what you wear... They clean your gutters out in the fall or something. Right. right. No, yeah. I mean, you guys dress appropriately. And, yeah. And you dress for your audience so you're not offensive. Or you don't, like Paul said, you don't want to offend them or right. whatever. So, I mean, if you wear a nice shirt and you're clean and stuff, I don't know what the big the, the deal is. but I mean, Yeah, I don't either. And again, that was, like, this was, again, some of the stuff that I, I dealt with growing up. And then I thought it was funny when my relatives, like I said, mentioned it for, yeah. for preaching. Because, again, I, I guess I don't have... <clears throat> And I know I'm a younger generation, and styles are, are shifting a little bit from my parents and the one before, but I don't yeah. hold the same notion for dressing up like really fancy for that. Well, you know, <laughs> once you get caught up in the web of legalism, there's no yeah. getting out. Oh, no. Yeah. There's no getting out. can start to become something. And it's, you... it's an act of fertility <clears throat> even to live your life. And it yeah. becomes very depressing because you go, I can't keep this. I can't do all this. And yet I want to. Yeah. And how am I going to do this? And and everybody's there to point at you going, well, you, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. But they're the ones who are, are not doing it in another way. Right. Just It's it's just a matter yeah. of, of well, And to me, it's just like, where are they getting the legalistic? <clears throat> like, where in Scripture does it say you yeah. must wear this or you have to dress this way? Right. No. I don't you know, know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, to me, like the legalistic, I'm just like... It's, where's your backing biblically? Yeah, where biblically. Is it where's biblically? Where's your scripture? Well, well, it's, 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 it's in the Bible. The Pharisees did that. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it, it is biblical. The Pharisees did it. Well, and then that leads you to the other point. It's like if they're going to have le- a legalistic outlook, <laughs> is that a church you want? Them, man, I suppose. Yeah. <clears throat> you want that for them? <laughs> Stay humble. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So our religious actions, so circumcision, I just use these two because we're going to talk about these more in Romans chapter 4. Circumcision was meant to just be a symbol for the Jews, just as our baptism is is a symbol. It was an outward action of an inward change. The baptism is the same. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, so I was just saying, so Christians, now it doesn't matter if you're physically circumcised, once you get saved... We're baptized. That's again. It's the symbol of just kind of the outward profession. Doesn't care about your actual circumcision. <laughs> um, but it also, as he mentions here, should be part of our praise. So everything that we do, we should want to do, and this desire for wanting is part of our praise to God. Mm-hmm. I want to read the Bible. I want to pray. I want to connect with with with, with Christ. Mm-hmm. I want to go to church. I want to stop doing certain things. I want to start doing other things that are more, more godly, more Christ-like. And all of these are part of our, our growth as our sanctification. And it gives more of the praise to God. Because then our testimony, as we grow, becomes that much stronger with everything that we're changing. I was just saying Psalm 37 that God gives you the desires of your heart. Mm-hmm. And if you, know, you don't have that desire, maybe you don't have them in your heart. You know what I mean? I really like that. Yeah. yeah, I've never heard it that way. I like that a lot. 
That's actually the true <clears throat> content of it. If God will give you the desires of your heart, yeah. And if your desires are not like Him, God, then He would not go. I really yeah. like that. Yeah, look at it. I will. <laughs> read, read it. It'll up. show up somewhere. Absolutely. Read it up in the original, <laughs> and you'll find that is the context. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's.